Great Game or What, Episode 2, our March Madness edition. So we have Chris Young, General Manager of the Texas Rangers, joining us. Not only did he win a World Series last year as a GM, he also played college basketball at Princeton. And he's the tallest man ever to hit a triple in a major league game. He's going to tell us all about that. Why are we not surprised that that's the number one thing that (laughs) my dad comes up with? But before we get into today's episode, we got to say thank you to everybody who followed the show, wherever you listen to your podcasts or watching on YouTube. Thank you so much because we were pretty overwhelmed with the amount of support that came out when our first episode dropped on opening day. And what I heard most was uh, you and your son sound exactly alike on the air, which Jeff. I don't think it's a good thing because I can say without hesitation, the only one with a worse voice than you is me, but it's okay. We're together on this. I did the Golic podcast, Mike and Mike Jr. And I think physically they have to be the largest father son podcast duo ever in their primes. They weighed over 300 pounds each. And in our primes, we don't weigh 300 pounds together. And now, Jeff, and help me with this. Help me with this. I was at Citizens Bank Park the other day after the podcast came out, and some guy came running up to me. He, like, tackled me, and he said, I listened to the podcast. You are so dope. What, what does that mean? Did, did he call me a dope, or is that, is that what people say right. these days? I have to explain. Dope is a good thing. I know... Dope for you probably is marijuana related. Smoking dope. Right. You're not even allowed to say that anymore. Even that's wrong, right? No, dope is is a good thing. In fact, my daughter's name is McKinley Hope. Middle name is Hope and the last name Kirkchen. And so I say I sing songs where Hope rhymes with dope. Or McKinley <laughs> Hope, you're so dope. It's stupid. But I, I, I'm glad I could inform you on that. And it's funny because I was at the same Philadelphia Phillies game that you were at. You called it on ESPN uh, radio. And I was there with our eight, near eight-month-old daughter, and it was her second Phillies game, mind you, second Major League Baseball game, and we tailgated. Now, I know this is a, a thing that you're a little bit unfamiliar with in the sense of you get to the ballpark eight hours before, not to drink an entire 30 case of beer, but to interview the players before. But this is what people do. They tailgate these exciting games. And so we brought, with our kickball team, all of our friends got together, and we brought a pack-and-play to the tailgate. So we could put McKinley in a pack-and-play, and she could play while we were drinking 100 beers. So people were chugging beers while your tiny little infant daughter is in a pack-and-play in the middle of a parking lot. I can't say that it was my proudest fatherly moment, but it was a great game. It was a lot of fun, and it was great to take. Right. And, and, again, that's the lesson for the first week of the baseball season is the games have started, and they actually count. And there is no substitute, Jeff, as you know, for being at the ballpark because when you're at the ballpark, you can learn stuff that you can't learn anywhere else. For instance, I went into Philly's manager, Rob Thompson's managerial office, and I just, as after talking about baseball, I just casually asked him, like, what uh, what did you do? Did you do anything fun in the off season? He said, "Yeah, we went to Canada, my family and I, and we went dog sledding in Canada." <laughs> so he explained the whole thing. There are six dogs, and he's driving the sled. The two really smart dogs are up front because they know where to go. Then they're the middle dogs, and then they're the big dogs. I guess that's the real yeah. wheel, uh, rear wheel, wheel drive or something, whatever we're gonna call it. And he's driving, and he said, uh, he said, I thought you would yell mush to get him go, but that's not what you say. You say to them, you say uh, hike when you want him to go. Hike! Then you, if you want him to slow down, you say ease, and then if you want to stop him, you say whoa. So I learned something from the manager of the Phillies, but it wasn't necessarily about baseball. It was about dog sledding. And we can tell how much my dad knows about cars when he struggled with Real rear <laughs> wheel driving. My dad has bought the same Honda Accord every seven years in order to continue. Because it's all about consistency, Jeff. I know how the car drives. All right. If that's not Tim Kirkton, I don't know so, what is. So I asked, uh, was your was your wife like front wheel, you know, like giving you a hard time about the way you were driving? Right. Right. <laughs> he, he told us that the, that the instructors told him, whatever you do, don't ever let go of the slide if it tips you have to hang on because the dogs will just run without you so the 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 sled actually tipped and 
Rob Thompson, the manager of the Phillies, is like his, he's got snow flying into his face and into his mouth, but he hung on, and then he got the, the sled back up. So that's what he did during the offseason. Yeah, maybe he called Cuba Gooden Jr. for some snow dogs advice. Uh, speaking of first week of the season, so much excitement surrounding that. And one thing that I know you've done forever is after each game, after each day of games the next morning, have a Diet Mountain Dew. Yeah, yeah sure. Always. And, and, re- and read the box scores. Six o'clock in the morning. There is nothing better in the world for me than a quiet house, Diet Mountain Dew, and then I can dive in and look at the box scores. The box scores have been a part of my life since I was five years old. I think my mother taught me taught me how to read by reading the box scores every morning, and it is still a thrill to this day to get up and read the box scores to see everything that happened last night. Well, throw your readers on there and uh, tell us, do you have a line of the week? Well, there are a bunch of lines. There, there are a bunch of lines. There are a bunch of quirkjins from the week. For yeah. instance, on opening day, this was beautiful. The Diamondbacks scored 14 runs in one inning against the Rockies. No team had ever scored 14 runs on opening day in the history of baseball, and they did it without hitting a home run. So I checked with the Elias Sports Bureau. You know I call them a lot. And I asked, when's the last time any team scored 14 runs in an inning without hitting a home run? And that was the 1948 Red Sox, your grandfather, one of his favorite teams. So that's why I call the Elias all the time. Yeah, I feel like the Elias Sports Bureau was like a groomsman in your wedding with how much you called them. Yes. <laughs> I, I talked to you and, and your Elias. sister and your mother more than the Elias in the off season, not during the season. <laughs> I'm definitely talking to them more. The other thing that I really loved was uh, the Braves in the first two games of the season had eight individual three-hit games by six different players so that's only happened one time starting with 1900 and that was 1900 boston had six guys with a three hit game within the first two days of the season and that's what the braves did this year the elias of course helped me with that and the other thing julio rodriguez the great center fielder for the mariners he got his first walk-off rbi of his career now he's a young guy this is just his third year. But you would have thought he would have hit a walk-off homer, a walk-off single. He got his first walk-off RBI. And that's only important. It's not important. But Norm Cash, who played in the big leagues for years, had 1,104 RBIs. And he never had a walk-off RBI of any kind in his career. Not a sacrifice fly, ground out, hit by pitch, home run. Never had a walk-off RBI in his career. That's disappointing. <laughs> Yeah. You would think he ends his career thinking, man, I never had that shining right. moment running around the bases. <laughs> right, you would think. And what, you had a quirk, Jen, right? About- yeah, well, we were talking about this in episode one, and if you haven't had a chance to listen, it's all about opening day, so it has all of the ins and outs of opening day. So go back to episode one if this is your very first episode you're uh, enjoying. We talked about opening day home runs, and the Boston Red Sox players now gone five straight opening days. Right, Who right. was that? That was uh, Tyler O'Neill. Yeah hit a home run on opening day for the fifth consecutive season. No one in the history of baseball has ever done that. And he doesn't even have a hundred career homers, but he's hit a homer on opening day five years in a row. And we told you on last week's podcast, Adrian Beltre hit 477 homers and never hit one on, on opening day. Johnny bench, 389 homers, never hit one on opening day. By the way, Tyler O'Neill's dad, Tyler O'Neill is built like this. His dad was like Mr. Canada. He's like a weightlifting bodybuilding right. expert, just like, just like your dad. Right. <laughs> and so he gets his strength from his father, but he seems to get most of his strength seemingly on opening day. The only body I remember you building is a little Lego body. When I was a kid, you put the, the body on the pants and the head on the body from there. That's the only body building we're doing. I, I got it. The other thing we love, Jeff, about the first week of the baseball season is you get to keep score of a oh, major league yeah. game. Now, again, I've been doing this since I was five years old, but when you get that first lineup card and you get to f- put that first 6-3 or whatever you like, it, it's still a big thrill to me because I, I've i loved keeping score. My dad, your grandfather, taught me to keep score when I was just a little kid. And <laughs> I'll never forget. You remember Bob DiBiasio, our dear friend yeah. with, with the... 
Guardians used to be the Indians. He told me once that at the midwinter banquet, they uh, they had a scorekeeping like seminar that Bobby ran, where he was on like you know big display screen showing people how to do official scoring calls and everything yeah. else. So he showed a very intricate call on like how to make a fielder's choice there or something like that. And from the back of the room, a nun raises her hand and says, no, 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 that's not how I would score that play. Let me show you how I would score the play. A nun in the back of the room. And I swear to you, last year at LA, I'm doing a game and uh, I'm walking through the stands, going up to the press box, and I see a nun with a scorecard in her hand, and it was the greatest thing ever. That's so perfect. I was at Game 7 in Cleveland when the Cubs beat Cleveland Game 7, breaking their long-standing World Series drought curse. And the coolest thing, I have to say, was seeing so many Chicago fans keeping score during that game because the most valuable thing to them was being there, but then to have that book and say, I was there, and look, I kept score of the entire game. That's something special. That's unlike any other sport, I really believe. Right. You know Tom Wheeler from church, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Former federal judge, okay? For a birthday present, his son called me and said, and Tom, of course, big, big Cubs fan. Tom's an older man, so he'd never seen them win before they won in 2016, of course. So he had his son. I sent his son my scorecard. My keeping score of game seven of the World Series in 2016 and sent it to Tom and he put it in a frame because it was someone who was at the game who was keeping score. That's how much keeping score can mean. Thank God that was sent to a family friend or else we would have found it on eBay. <laughs> Tim Kirkshin's scorecard for 2016. Were you keep, do you have a scorecard from the game you just called at well, ESPN? It's, it, it's in my bag. I'll, yeah. yeah, I'll get it later. The other thing that I love about opening day, Jeff, is, and I am really anal about this is I always start a new notebook on opening day. As you know, I've used the exact same Mead notebook for 25 years. And every day I put in the date, like games of March 28th. And I write down all the things that I see and I observe. And I, as you know, I never go anywhere without my notebook. You've seen me taking this to the bathroom, to the shower, whatever I'm doing. I don't go anywhere just in case someone might call me when I need it. We are also following this season on the podcast. We're doing a sack fly tracker. This is really exciting because if you don't know this, my dad is fascinated by sacrifice flies. So much so his third book was named I'm Fascinated by Sacrifice Flies, begging the one question we all have. With a title that ridiculous, what will his fourth book be called? (laughs) Yeah. So our, what are we, I mean, there's been a lot of sack flies, flies already. Right. So I check with the Elias Sports Bureau just to be sure. Last year, 0. .506, there were 0. .506 sacrifice per game. So like a, uh, basically a half. Right. Now it's almost 0. .700. So we've had way more sacrifice flies this year than, than we had last year. Now the interesting part is last year, Travis Jankowski of, Rangers, who used to be with the Phillies, he hit his first sacrifice fly of his career. He had gone 1,389 plate appearances without a sacrifice fly. And since I wrote a book with that name on it, I was charting Travis Jankowski all that time. And when he finally hit a sacrifice fly at 6 o'clock in the morning, I've got a Diet Mountain Dew with me, and I go, oh, my God, he did it. <laughs> so I saw him quite a bit during the postseason, and I said, Travis, you you know you hit a sacrifice fly, right, for the first time? And he goes, well, of course I do. The ball is in my locker, and it stays in my locker. That's how important it was. And Corey Seager, the shortstop on the Rangers, who rarely has much to say, he's not very public about anything. The minute that Travis Jankowski hit his first sacrifice fly, Corey Seager ran to the top step of the dugout and said, you did it! You did it like that. He knew of the sacrifice fly. It was like hitting a grand slam, but a a little less eventful in that matter. Right. Now we've got Chris Young. He's the general manager of the Texas Rangers. It is March Madness. We're in the middle of it right now, and I'm excited to have him on because he is a former center of Princeton, six foot ten. We're going to talk, have a lot of fun with him. We're not going to get into the X's and O's of what the Rangers are going to do this year. So if you don't care for the Rangers, they're not your team. Trust me, you're going to enjoy the conversation. 
And I, you know, Dad, there was a recent headline in in pop culture. I know I'm scaring you now. Yeah. Uh, pop artist Lizzo has decided to quit her career, kind of at the height of where things are right now. Are you familiar with Lizzo? Um. No. Oh, I I actually think I saw that. I heard. I read that she was tired of getting dragged on the internet. Is that the verb that she used? Wow. Did, have I got this right? Yeah. Who in the I, world? I would. I, I was walking through a room at ESPN and I saw dragged uses a verb. I've been dragged on the internet before myself, <laughs> by the way, so I know a little bit about this. So what happened? So well, she's decided kind of at the height of her career, she's gone through some difficult. PR nightmares lately, but my question for you, Dad, and this comes from our friend Marty, who texted me and said wanted me to ask: Does this quitting at the basically the peak of her career? Does this remind you at all of Sandy Koufax in comparison to a great Hall of Famer, kind of kind of leaving it all on the field at the top of his game? Well, Sandy Koufax was hurt, and I think Sandy Koufax is in a different category than Lizzo. Unless she's really great she's at this. She's winning Grammys. And she's doing great right, Sandy things. Koufax went 97 and 27 his last four years. Right. Okay? He led the league in strikeouts all of those years. He was the greatest pitcher in the game, one of the greatest pitchers that we've ever seen, and he quit at the, at the prime of his career, but he had an elbow injury. He could barely lift his arm, and he got tired and tired and tired trying to pitch through pain. So that's why Sandy Koufax retired 97 and 27. And then he quit. In the first episode, we talked briefly about how Mike Trout and Ed Sheeran, Mike Trout is the Ed Sheeran of the music industry and, or of baseball. And Ed Sheeran is the Mike Trout of, of music. And it's really hard to convince you of any of these comparisons with your little knowledge. I have one more question. Did you hear that Beyonce came out with a country album? Uh, are you, <laughs> I, I did. I got asked the other day, do no I know way. one Beyonce song? And the answer was an emphatic, no. I told you, Jeff, I don't know anything about music. This is why you're here. I'm here to educate you about baseball. You're here to educate me about music. I told you, I thought Molly Hatchett was a woman <laughs> until very recently. <laughs> I was sure growing up that Jethro Tull was a guy, but of course that he wasn't. And I can't believe I'm going to acknowledge this on the air. I have one other time. For a short time in my life, I wasn't sure if Kanye West was a man <laughs> or a woman. Okay? Because Kanye West sounds like a female right. country music star. I did not realize for a short period in my life that Kanye West was a man. We're, Sorry. You're growing. I'm glad because I could see your mouth making Western, country Western and we've right, learned it's right. just country music now. Right. So my point of bringing Beyonce up is this is our March Madness edition, and the greatest basketball player of all time, Michael Jordan, called it quits and decided, I'm a great athlete. I'm going to go play baseball. Beyonce, who's a great musician, said, I'm going to go to country music for an album. It's kind of similar in the comparison. All right, what it, look, the, going from basketball to baseball is a gigantic transition, a thousand times bigger than going from – what was she doing? Pop? Yeah. Pop? Pop, <laughs> Pop to, con to country. Yeah. You're telling me basketball to baseball is the same transition? She's singing. She's not trying to hit 97 when she hasn't seen it since high school. I think in this instance, I would agree with you that it's harder to transition from basketball to baseball than it is to cut a country album. But we'll have to see how the country album does. It might become a smash hit. It just came out. And I know you've got it on your, uh, you still use CDs, right, in your car? So we'll make sure it plays on your ride home from Right, uh, so the that's studio. a pet peeve of yours, Jeff. Country music is, is now country, not country western. So that qualifies as a pet peeve. For I just you. think country western is a different generation, generation. of well, music. Yeah, my generation. I have pet peeves for baseball. Look, and again, I don't want to come across as some pedantic little twit here, but there are little things about baseball that I saw the first week of the season that, that just yeah. throw me throw me off just a little bit. And again, don't think I'm a bit. All right, I'm a baseball snob on some things, right? Mm -hmm. When you hit a one hopper that bounces into the stands, that is an automatic double, not a ground rule double, okay? An automatic double means everyone advances two bases by rule. 
A ground rule double is when the ground rules of the specific ballpark apply. So if you hit a ball under the tarp at this field or you hit a ball into the ivy at Wrigley Field or you hit the roof at Tropicana Field, now we have a ground rule in effect. So that's one of my pet peeves from the week. Am I being a pedantic little twit or not? Never not, Ben. (laughs) That's the second time we've used pedantic twit today, and it was on last week's episode, too. (laughs) Well, it's a great word, and I love it. The the other thing that happened this week that bothers me just a little bit, Jeff, is we had some hit-by-pitches, okay? And again, I hope I don't offend anyone here, but when you bean somebody, okay, that means you hit them in the head. Okay, this is called your bean. If you hit a guy in the back or in the butt, you didn't bean him. You hit him with a pitch. If you hit him in the head, you beaned him. Am I being unreasonable? No, I actually, quite frankly, I didn't know that. I I didn't realize there was a difference between the two. I thought you were beaning him. And in fact, it was just fun. I was watching a game at the end of last season and someone said, beam him, B-E-A-M. And I had to correct, it's bean him. Right. All right. Well, now you learned about bean balls and, and I learned about Beyonce. Now pick up that glove and I'll give you my third little yep. tiny little ridiculous pet peeve. Okay. There you go. So you, you do it for me, Jeff. What yep. is this thing called? It's called a glove. Why is it called a glove? Uh, because it has fingers. Oh Look, yeah. I had no idea. When you put on your winter gloves, Jeff, yeah. you have fingers. Oh, okay. Yeah. When you put on your winter mittens, it has a thumb and no fingers. So that is a baseball glove. Wow. Everyone who's ever played in the major leagues calls that a glove, except for the first baseman and the catcher. They use a mitt. The catcher's mitt, it's a first baseman's mitt. That is a glove. So if you're buying your son his first mitt and he's six years old, go ahead. It's okay. I'm just telling you, the, the higher you go in baseball, the more this becomes a mitt. I mean, a glove, not a mitt. All right, so this is an exciting new addition to the podcast this week. It's called The League in the Lid. So I've taken every single team, all 30 teams. I've cut up pieces of paper, Dad. I'm going to put you to the test here. I need one story every week. Maybe a different team will do a league in or the league in the lid. And this week, you need a story... About the Cincinnati Reds. Can you give me a red story, your best story? Well, I have a million red story, but there's an important red story here, Jeff. And you might not even know this because you're 12 years old, but <laughs> the ceremonial opener in Major League Baseball for years and years and years was always in Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. The first game of the season was always played in Cincinnati. And even though they still do this, they would run a parade down the streets of Cincinnati to signify not just the red season is starting, Major League Baseball season is starting. And look, I'm okay that we're opening in Seoul, South Korea. We've opened in Japan, and we've opened all over the place now. But being a purist at heart, being 67 years old, I still think it was really, really cool that Cincinnati was the place for the ceremonial first pitch for any game in baseball every year. Well, I'm, I'm glad. That was great. I feel like you got nervous when I came up with this with this bit to make you tell a story about a team. Well, it was an easy first one. If you, if you call up something on the Rays, I'm not sure if I'm going to have anything good for the first week. But Cincinnati is really important in baseball history for that reason. Yeah, your team could get pulled next week for the league in the lid. you got to make sure to follow wherever you are listening right now or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And coming up, we're going to do It's in the Card, similar to what we just did. However, we're going to open a pack of Topps baseball cards. We're going to rifle through, see how many stories my dad can get through. Uh, And then, of course, Chris Young is going to join us, general manager of the Texas Rangers. He's taller than the both of us. If he stood on my (laughs) shoulders, we wouldn't be taller than Chris Young. That's all coming up next. It's in the cards. Tim and Jeff Kirkshin here on Is This a Great Game or What? This is where we open up a deck of cards, and we just kind of let my dad go off and tell some stories. So here we go. All right, this is Topps. See what we've got. Is there any better sound than that? Oh, I loved it. I used to love to open these up when I was a kid. It was a thrill that a six year old couldn't get anywhere else. All right, so let's take a look. All right, first one right out of the gate. We've got a Tim Kirkshin tops card. 
available in your local top right, spec today. That, let's put okay, a real I'm player sorry, down. I'm sorry. Okay, real players down here. Uh, Luis Castillo, Seattle uh, Mariners. Yes, he has as good a stuff as there basically is in the major leagues. I covered his playoff game two years ago against the the Blue Jays in Toronto, and he was so dominant for seven innings that the next day Manny Acta, the the one of the coaches for the Mariners. So he's a coach on Luis Castillo's team told me we need to move the bat, the mound back to 65 feet because the stuff today is too good. Those hitters last night had no chance to react to Luis Castillo. Got to move the, the, the mound back five feet. That's how good he was. How about Josh Lowe of the Tampa Bay Rays? Oh, love Josh Lowe, brother Nathaniel Lowe of the Rangers. So Josh Lowe during the postseason last year told me, that he loves to take batting practice without his shoes on. He takes it with just his socks on. Now, Jeff, he's taking BP inside, and they're not using real baseballs, but they're being shot out of the pitching machine at 100 miles an hour. But they're soft just in case he pounds one into his, you know, his foot, which doesn't have a shoe on. So I said, what? why are you doing that? He goes, it, my feet are way more grounded when I don't have my spikes on. I love hitting without my shoes on. And if they would let me, he said, I would take real batting practice every day in, in just in my socks and not in my shoes. Shoeless Joe Jackson. Well, now it's shoeless low. <laughs> shoeless Josh low. Uh, next card. Ooh, this is a Only but a goodie, Roger Clemens in a Blue Jays uniform. All right, Roger Clemens, of course, seven Cy Youngs, one of the greatest pitchers of all time, had two 20-strikeout games in his career. And, Jeff, they were 10 years apart. Think about that, how good you got to be. So after the first 10-strikeout game, 1986 against the Mariners, he goes to Seattle for his next start, okay? He was in Boston, now he's going to Seattle. So... He does a pregame radio show with uh, the host from Seattle. And the host starts the interview with, tomorrow, Roger, you're going to face the Mariners. And the last time you faced the Mariners, you struck out 30. (laughs) (laughs) So Roger, who had every right to punch the guy right in the neck, said to the guy, yeah, actually it was only 20. And the guy pats Roger on his shoulder and goes, well, Maybe 30 the next time. To which Roger would have, should have said, yeah, I'm going to pitch 10 innings, and I'm going to strike out everyone. It's 20, not 30. You know, I had a chance to talk to Cody Clemens, his son, who's in the minor league system for the Phillies, and I went down there for spring training for my country radio station here in Philly, and he said that when all of them get together, his dad, his brothers, and everything, they, they bet while playing golf. And he said, the only goal is to try to get into dad's wallet. But they're all really good athletes. (laughs) So, I mean, it's way better than when the Kirkshans get together for a golf tournament. Not not quite the same thing. All right, who's next? All right, last but not least, this is the last one we'll do for It's in the Cards. And uh, if you go onto YouTube as well, if you're listening, thank you. You can also see us opening these cards. This is a a Ken Griffey Jr. card. All right, now Ken Griffey Jr. is one of the five or six greatest center fielders of all time. He did things that no one's ever seen before. After Willie Mays, he was the next guy to hit 50 homers in a gold glove season. So about three years ago, I'm writing a story about Willie Mays' 90th birthday. So, of course, I have to call Ken Griffey Jr. because he was the closest thing we'd seen to Willie Mays. So it took me like two weeks to find Ken Griffey Jr. Every time I called, he wasn't there. He swears to me that he called me back multiple times. I promise you he didn't. I carried this notebook with me for two weeks just in case Ken Griffey Jr. called back. Because when Jr. calls, you can't miss the call, especially when we're talking about Willie Mays. So your sister, Kelly, your godson, Carson, and I had gone to the uh, Clarksburg Mall Oh, in no. Maryland. So I, we are leaving the mall. We're just about ready to go. Ken Griffey Jr. still hasn't called me, but I've got my notebook in my hand. We get in the car, and Ken Griffey Jr. calls me, and I'm sitting in the front seat. And in the back seat, Kelly, your sister, has just begun breastfeeding her son, <laughs> who's four months old, in the back seat of the car, while I'm interviewing Ken Griffey Jr. about the greatest player I've ever seen, 
Willie Mae. So I tell Junior, I said, listen, I'm so glad you called. Just understand that in the backseat of my car right now is my daughter breastfeeding my grandson. And he thought that was the funniest thing ever. And it's the best Ken Griffey Jr. interview I have ever done. He was so engaging. He was so great, mainly because we were talking about Willie Mays, his hero, but also because he recognized what's going on in the car. And that image just really tickled him. <laughs> I have no words. That right, is one of the right, best that's stories. A stopper that right beats there. the one where you, you did the interview in the stall of the bathroom with your notebook. Who were you talking well, to then? Yeah. That was Tony Gwynn was right. supposed to call me back. <laughs> Tony Gwynn didn't call me back. So finally, he calls me back. I'm at a restaurant, and I've got my notebook with me. He calls. When Tony Gwynn calls, you take the call. So the quietest place in the restaurant was the stall in the bathroom. So I went in there and interviewed Tony Gwynn in the bathroom. One of my friends from the restaurant came in and he heard me interviewing somebody on the phone. And he said, what were you doing in there? I said, I was, I was interviewing a player. He said, who? I said, Tony Gwynn. He said, you interviewed Tony Gwynn in the bathroom. I said, yes. When Tony Gwynn calls, you take the call. You know, my favorite, my favorite story. And I promise you, dad, I'm not going to make you look like some hoity toity guy. When I tell this story, one rule growing up, like a lot of households, don't answer the phone during dinner, right? That was a rule. And dad got a call during dinner and looked at us and, and with his eyes, you could see, I got to take this phone call. But my mother was not pleased. Runs upstairs, gone for 15, 20 minutes, comes back down. And now that I've been married almost two years, I, I really understand the look she was giving you. And she gave you the best question ever, honey, who was so important that was calling you right now that you had to leave dinner with your family? And calmly you said, honey, that was the White House. <laughs> <laughs> and dad had been invited to be one of the sports writers to join all the living Hall of Famers at the White House. George Bush, obviously a huge baseball fan, had invited all. And that was your formal invitation. <laughs> and that was the only time I think I've ever seen a man get away with answering the phone while at dinner. Well, let's be clear. Mr. Bush didn't call me. Right. One of his <laughs> aides called me and we went to the White House and I didn't get in any trouble for leaving the dinner table. That's so amazing that you just brought up Tony Gwynn in that story because he was a great college basketball player on top of being a Hall of Fame baseball player. And it's March Madness week, right? We've got the Final Four coming up and that's why we have Chris Young who's going to be joining us. Texas Rangers general manager. They won the World Series last year under his leadership and he's six foot ten, and he played for Princeton back in college. Right, Tony Gwynn, by the way, had the littlest hands of any great major leaguer I've ever seen. My hands, I got big hands for a little guy. My hands are twice as big as Tony Gwynn's hands. He couldn't palm a basketball, no chance. And yet he was the all-time assist leader at San Diego State when he retired, when he stopped playing basketball. But I've always loved the connection, Jeff, between baseball and basketball. So many good players played both sports, Dave DeBusher a million years before you, threw a shutout for the Chicago White Sox and was a Hall of Fame basketball player mm -hmm. for the New York Knicks. And in today's game, you know, Chris Young, who we're going to have on, I mean, he's the center on our all-active baseball team. He's 6'10". Tony Clark, who leads the Players Association, he averaged 44 points a game in high school. <laughs> He, and, you know, Aaron Judge would be on this team, 6'8", power forward. You know, I covered Delino DeShields, who was going to go play basketball at Villanova. And I once asked him, I said, if you hadn't played baseball, do you think you could have played in the NBA? And he looked at me and goes, of course I could have. <laughs> Kenny Lofton played. Kenny Lofton is a borderline Hall of Famer, great yeah. player for the Indians. I asked, he played at Arizona. I asked him the same question once. I said, do you think you could have played in the NBA? And he gave me that look. He said, of course I could have played. The, both of them had the exact same answer. When are you going to learn your lesson asking these right. guys that question? So <laughs> I, I, I played a lot of basketball growing up, as you know, and I, I used to play every once in a while with Mike Flanagan, the late Mike Flanagan pitcher for the Orioles. So, and he was one of the great shooters ever. So one year he goes home for the all-star break and 
comes back to Kansas City. I'm covering the team. So I just casually asked him, what'd you do during the break? And he said, oh, I just kind of hung out with my nephew. We shot some free throws. So I said, how many in a row did you make? And he very sheepishly looked at me and he goes, uh, I made 104 in a row. This is a Major League Baseball pitcher at the All-Star break. He made 104 in a row. So the team's on the road. So I write this in the Baltimore Sun the next day. And he, he gets a call from his wife and he sees me the next day and he goes, listen, I just wanted to clarify something about what you put in the paper today. He said, I didn't miss the 105th shot. My nephew got tired of feeding me, so we quit. <laughs> so he made 104 in a row without missing during the All-Star break. The only free throw shooting that's better than that, in my opinion, is your sister, Kelly, senior year in high school, made 54 out of 56 free throws, which is the greatest free throw shooting in the history of the school. And I love basketball so much, and that's why – this whole, you know, final four week is going to be so good. And the women's final four is the best I've ever seen. It's I don't, uh, that, unbelievable. Caitlin Clark is the greatest female player ever. She, I think the final four for the women has been equally as entertaining as that of the men. I would agree. And how many did Kelly, my sister, make in a row during that 54-56? Right. The school record was 19 in a row. She made 32 in a row to start the season. Then she missed one, and then she made 20 in a row. So she broke the previous record twice Twice. within the same season. And dad was paying attention to that. And every dad can relate to this. And I have a a baby girl. She's almost eight months old. And when Kelly first, you know, started talking about her now husband, who was her first boyfriend in college, right? And they, they dated all throughout. Now they're married and have two kids. One of dad's first questions was not, does he treat you with respect? You know, where's he's from? Is he from a good family? It was, can he shoot the three? <laughs> and the answer is, yeah, he had a pretty good shot. Well, only a couple things matter to me if you're a boy. Can you throw a baseball and can you shoot the three? If you can do both of those, you're good with me. Chris Young is joining us. He can do both of those things. <laughs> uh, he's a former Princeton basketball player, general manager of the Texas Rangers. He's joining us next here on Is This a Great Game or What? Is this a great game or what? And it's March Madness, and we have a guy who played college basketball but now is very much in the world of baseball as the general manager of the world champion Texas Rangers. Chris Young is on with us. Standing at six foot ten, Dad, he's taller than the both of us combined. <laughs> Chris, thank you for joining us. Guys, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, so Chris, you won a World Series as a player. Now you've won a World Series as an executive. But I want to start with when you played for the Padres and you guys had a free throw competition as a Major League <laughs> Baseball player. Tell us that story. Well, Tim, it's it's a great memory. And uh, it, it really goes back to Bud Black came over as manager of the Padres in 2007. And one of his things for team building during spring training was uh, to really get to know each player on the team. He tried to uh, find ways to connect. And um, with me, and we also had Will Venable there, um, one of the things that he wanted to do, he was curious about our basketball background. So he thought it would be a great idea to have a free throw competition or a shooting competition <laughs> during spring training. And he, he ordered the clubhouse attendants to, to get a big portable basketball hoop, set it up in the parking lot. We made it a huge deal where we had to pick teams and, and he buddy required that everybody had to, everybody in camp had to place a bet on a team. And so every, t- everybody had a vested interest in the outcome of the shooting competition. And so over the course of spring training, it, it, it garnered a lot of uh, interest in the team, in the, in the clubhouse. And then I probably two thirds of the way through camp, we, we did the competition. We had weeks to practice. And so it was one of these moments where you had to really be selective and who you thought, you know, everybody said they played high school hoops and everybody <laughs> in their mind was a great basketball player. Right, and so course. you really had to vet through and determine when you're selecting the team in this, this clubhouse draft, who actually, you know, really could shoot. And I remember the first year I picked my team and I thought, all right, we've got some veteran players. I trust their ability to self-evaluate. I trust that they were good athletes and uh, that they could could hold their own. And what stood out to me was uh, w- one of my favorite teammates I've ever had was David Boomer Wells. 
And when Boomer got in this environment, it wasn't like pitching in front of 40,000 at Yankee Stadium. This was more pressure, and, <laughs> and Boomer felt it. And his legs were shaking, and and he had a few. He had some trouble making free throws, and uh, I don't think Boomer fared too well. So, and I'm telling you, it was it was so fun. It was so memorable. It brought the team together. You know, we had Brian Giles on that team, and Brian um, was a very he was a great teammate, and he was hell-bent on distracting guys during this competition and and brian may have come out uh without clothes and a fire extinguisher at one point in the competition and i'm talking about uh this was a great pressure environment and uh, a lot of fun and great team building so um did you win or did will's team win well, I think there were multiple teams, and Buddy was on a team too. And I, I, my team that first year did not win. And I remember I was wow. mad. I was really pissed at myself. And uh, I, I shot okay, but not well enough. And and as a team, we didn't shoot well enough. So I, I <laughs> the next year, I don't think I went with the veteran guys. I think I went with a younger team. <laughs> well, you were a Closer. seventy, you were a seventy percent shooter at Princeton in your two years there at, from the free throw line. So I mean, I would yeah, put my money on your enough. team. <laughs> Well, not good enough. 70%. I should have been better than that. I wasn't talented enough to, to miss, you know, 30% of my free throws. <laughs> right, right. Chris, you were the rookie of the year in the Ivy League in both baseball and basketball. What is your biggest takeaway from your basketball experience at Princeton? Well, Tim, I have so many great memories of, of playing hoops at Princeton and really I think it has shaped and even to this day my view of what a team should be and I think those Princeton teams were known for maybe not being the most talented teams but being able to compete on the biggest stage against the best competition uh, because of the way they played and the way the team came together and the style of play and um to me, that really resonates even today in terms of the team building. And I, I really subscribe to this idea that it's not always the most talented teams that win championships. It's the right group of guys, the right teams that come together. And there's a culture component to that. And so, uh, you know, my Princeton basketball days really taught me that. And I, I just have so many great memories. I still have great relationships with my teammates, but I loved there was nothing better than going into a big time basketball environment and playing a top, you know, a top ranked team and knowing that you didn't, you know, you were the underdogs and that you didn't really stand a chance, but we're going to give it our best and we're going to go find out. And that moment just before the tip off, I remember the nerves. It was similar to pitching in a big league game, but those nerves. And then all of a sudden I'd walk out on the court and something would come over me and I'd feel this, I got this. We, we got this. We can do this. And that inner belief and conviction, and it would come over me right before tip off. And then once the game started, it just, you know, you gave it your best. And more often than not against those big time opponents, we came up short. But I love those environments. College basketball is, is wonderful. Uh, Chris, the Sacramento Kings offered you a two year deal to play in the NBA. How close did you come to leaving baseball to go to the NBA? Well, Tim, it, first of all, I thought they were crazy for doing it. I, I was you know, <laughs> two years removed from college basketball at the time. And I thought, why in the world would they believe that I could leave uh, baseball right now and go play in the NBA? And uh, one of the assistant coaches for the Kings at the times was the legendary Princeton coach, Pete Carrill. I did not play for Coach Carrill at Princeton, uh, but I did have a, a very good relationship with him. And I asked Coach Carrill that. I said, Coach, why in the world do you think I could come play co uh, professional basketball when I haven't played even college basketball for the last couple of years? And he said, Chris, because you have one thing that you cannot teach, and that is vision. He said, you have vision, you know, you know how to play the game, you know which defender uh, to, to guard, you know which pass to make, you see plays happening before they happen. And because of that, I believe that you will learn the skills required because you have vision. And that always stuck with me. And uh, I think there's you know aspects of that that are applicable to baseball as well, that you see players who just have instincts and vision that can anticipate before the play actually occurs. And I don't know if that can be taught. Uh, you know, it seems to be somewhat innate. It's certainly, you know, as Coach Carrill said, it was innate in basketball. But, you know, at the time when I had to make a decision, I was a struggling double A pitcher. I'd gone from prospect to suspect, and I wasn't sure if I was really going to have, you know, I wanted to be a major league pitcher. I thought I was capable of it, but I knew there was a lot of development that still needed to take place. And so it was a very tough 
tough decision. I came very close to leaving baseball and going. I think it at the time, a peace of mind came over me that I knew I've got a fallback plan if baseball doesn't work. And that actually freed me up. And I, I went mm. from double A to triple A. I made five starts in triple A and then got called up to the big leagues. And at which point I felt like I, I couldn't walk away from my big league career. Well, and speaking of that big league career, when we heard we were going to have Chris Young, general manager of the Texas Rangers on, I kindly asked my dad, I said, hey, you know, tell me a little bit about him. Give me some talking points. And the thing first out of his mouth was the tallest player ever to hit a triple in Major League Baseball history. I said, Dad, I was hoping for a little more background here, not what the Alliance Sports Bureau is telling you here. So tell us about what what that hit in your Major League career was like. Oh, man. Well, another great story. And Tim, you do bring this up, and I knew you knew this. So um, it, this is a really funny moment in my career, and it's self-deprecating because I, I was, I'm was i somewhat embarrassed. But um, I, it was 2006. I was playing for the Padres, and we were playing the Marlins. And I think we were winning five or six to nothing at the time. I think it was later in the game, maybe sixth or seventh inning. And I hit a, a sinking line drive to right field. The right fielder was already playing me in, knowing I probably couldn't hit it over his head. And so he was uh, came in, and he dove for the ball, and it got under his glove and went to the wall. And so, you know, knowing that it's the sixth inning of the game, I'm probably – we're winning the game. I want to get through the seventh. I, I think I've got a stand-up double. But as I coast into second base, I take a look at our third base coach, Glenn Hoffman, and he's waving me to third. So I think, okay, this must be a clear stand-up triple. <laughs> Well, as I'm coming into third base, I see Glenn getting the, the slide sign, get down. And he's doing it with a look of panic in his, vo- in, his, in his face that I can read. There's going to be a close play here. And so I make this terrible late slide into third base, and I almost kill Miguel Cabrera, who was playing third base. And there is a picture of this slide. And Miguel Cabrera, is he's got this look on his face going, <laughs> like that, trying to get out of the way of my ugly slide. So fortunately, I was safe, and uh, and I do have a triple in the books, but it's not one to, to brag about. <laughs> well, well, speaking of first, Chris, uh, yesterday I was watching Fever Pitch just in replays, and I was only on for like th- three minutes, and there I saw you throwing a pitch in the movie Fever Pitch, and you told me the story about it. Explain that story. Yeah, Tim, it's a great story. It was my first major league win. It was 2004. I had, you know, going back, that was the time where the Sacramento Kings were waiting on me to make a decision. And I had gone from double A to triple A. And then I got called up. It was my third major league start. It was in Fenway Park against what were going to become the world champion Boston Red Sox. Uh, I think we were on an eight game losing streak. I think they were on an eight game winning streak. And I I, um, got a Saturday afternoon start, Labor Day weekend. It was the most perfect, idyllic setting in New England and um, and we we won the game but it was uh, they were filming the movie they recreated opening day that day so they they had Stephen King throw out the first pitch they had a huge American flag over the the green monster um, you know all the normal fanfare trying to recreate opening day for the movie um, Drew Barrymore and Jimmy Fallon were in the stands. It was just such a wonderful memory. And, and fortunately, um, I got the win that day. So I never got to make an opening day start. Uh, but I do say that I had a memorable opening day game, which was for the movie Beaver Pitch, I think September 4th of 2004. So pretty cool story. And, you know, of course, my wife, she was in the stands, nervous as could be. And she, they're filming a movie and Jimmy Fallon and Drew Barrymore are in the stands. And she's thinking, is this is this how the big leagues are? Is this, is this normal? <laughs> Oh, uh, that is beautiful. Chris, when you watch March Madness or do you watch college basketball, do you still really enjoy it? And do you ever put yourself into the situation as a 6'10 former center playing against the big kid from Purdue or anything like that? Well, I do. I love hoops. I mean, it's such a great sport. I follow college hoops um, and really I follow Princeton hoops. I'm a huge Princeton hoops fan. Their head coach, Mitch Henderson, is a great friend and he's been a great supporter. And I just I root like crazy for Princeton men's and women hoops. And so, um, you know, that's probably where I follow the most. But, you know, Tim, anytime I watch a college basketball game, I, I see it through the eyes of a big man. And so, yes, when I see the Purdue center and how big he is, I just think about what a what a challenge that would be to go 
up against. I mean, I'm 6'10", but I would I would feel very small guarding him. And so I think about, you know, I'd have to play with my feet and really make sure constantly to have the best positioning possible, knowing that physically I would be outmatched. So, um, yeah, I, I love the game. I love watching. I've got three kids who all play hoops, and I, I try to share my knowledge and wisdom with them, but I think they're more interested in me being dad than coach. So uh, ultimately, but I love the sport. Do you, do you shoot around with the kids at all? When's the last time you shot a basketball? I, you know, I can still shoot a little bit. That's the extent of it. But I can't jump anymore. I can't run anymore. My <laughs> knees hurt. My back hurts. And so I, I can still beat the kids, and I'm not letting them win. I don't give them any. <laughs> it's coming soon where they're going to smoke me. But right now, I, I have bragging rights. But uh, I, I can shoot. That's about it. Physically, I'm um, – I'm, I'm not there. <laughs> When's the last time you dunked a basketball? Oh, it's been a few years. You know, I, it was in my playing days. I think it's about five years ago, maybe six years ago, right before I retired. I could still jump. I was a little bit lighter then and uh, more athletic. And since I've since you know taking over this job, the stress of this job, my body hurts more as a as a GM than it ever did as a player. Right. So I I, um, I, uh, I can't run. I can't jump. And uh, you know, I try my best to stay in shape, but I don't have as many hours in the day that I used to have. You know, the best part of being a player. Was I got to spend all day taking care of my body, and uh, now I, I try to spend all day finding an hour to to fit in a workout so that my body doesn't deteriorate. <laughs> All right, last thing for me, Chris. Jeff does music radio every morning. He's a country music guy, and there is oh, a I singer named Chris Young. Are you aware of that? Have you met him? And can you sing at all? I cannot sing and I'm, I'm not going to try. So, I, I, uh, but yes, I'm a big country music fan and I do know who Chris Young, the, the country music singer is. And uh, in fact, this is really funny. When I, I was hired as general manager of the Rangers, um, I think he put out a tweet that said, I am not the general manager and country music singer. I, that is a different person. And so um, anyway, it's really funny. But uh, but I do follow him. His music is great and uh, seems like a really good guy. So yeah. uh, at some point, I hope to meet him. You know, it's funny. My dad called me and said, hey, I'm coming up. We, we record this podcast in the basement of my house in Pennsylvania. So my dad drives up from Maryland and we record these podcast interviews. And he said, you got Chris Young. I told my wife, we've got Chris Young. She says, the country music star. <laughs> To the same degree, but hey, it, it, if you were a singer too, on top of being a baseball and basketball former collegiate athlete, former major leaguer, and a successful World Series winning player and general manager, it just wouldn't be fair to us little guys for you to have another tool in your toolbox with a golden voice. Well you know, the funny, there's another, the Chris Young, the outfielder as well. And so right. there were moments, I think there was a time where he got traded uh, mid season. And I had so many text messages from people <laughs> saying, Oh, I'm so, you know, I'm so excited for your trade. And, and um, anyway, and I've had fans actually come up to me and ask me to sign his baseball card, which is so funny uh, because we don't resemble each other. He's way more, he's way better looking and more athletic than I am. And, uh, but nonetheless, I have had fans ask me to sign the baseball card um, unknowingly that, um, you know, it's it's a different person, but uh, he's also a tremendous guy as well, and uh, has he's done great as a broadcaster. It's been following following his post uh, career as well. Chris Young, general manager of the Texas Rangers. Good luck this season. Thank you for joining us for our March Madness edition of Is This a Great Game or What? We really appreciate you joining the podcast. Thank you, Chris Young, and thank you for listening. Make sure to follow wherever you're listening, and if you want to watch as well, you can find us on YouTube. Just search. Is this a great game or what? You can see it there. We, we have great guests lined up. Actually, we have John Smoltz next week because the Masters will be revving up. We'll be done with college basketball. He's a great golfer. Hall of Fame pitcher John Smoltz is going to be joining us next week. But before we go, one kind of looking back at the episode here, you talked about a player who had over 1,000 RBIs and uh, he had never hit a, a, a game-winning RBI or a walk-off RBI. Norm Cash? Who is Norm Cash? Okay, Norm Cash was a Tigers first baseman late 50s through the 60s into the 70s. In 1961, he batted 361. He hit 42 homers, knocked in 132 runs. And in no other season in his career did he hit 300, hit 40 homers, or drive in 100 runs, and he did them all in one season. He's also one of 15 guys 
with four letters or fewer in his last name to hit 40 home runs in a season. And trust me, Jeff, I know all of these because I went to a party one night with your mother. Talk about getting your mother angry. A guy who I don't even know doesn't even say hello. He comes up to me when I walk in the room and says, 15 guys with four letters or less in their last name hit 40 homers in a season. And now I spend the rest of the party trying to guess them all because the gauntlet has been thrown down. I have no other life but to answer questions like this. And when I got Wally Post at 1 o'clock in the morning after the birth of my children, it was the greatest moment of my entire life. And Norm Cash, by the way, was the guy who faced Nolan Ryan once in a major league game. And Ryan's stuff was so unbelievably good that for one at bat, uh, Norm Cash brought the leg of a piano to home plate instead of a bat. <laughs> and, of course, he had to bring a real bat, but, the, but he told the media after the game, look, I can't hit him with a real bat. I thought I would try him with a piano leg. <laughs> oh, my gosh. The stories you have on Norm Cash. We could do a whole episode with Jeff, him. Jeff, I'm 67 years old. This was my wheelhouse growing up. I saw him in the 68 World Series. Love baseball then. Love it even more now. And uh, you love it, too. We appreciate you listening. Is this a great game or what? Wherever you get your podcasts, make sure to follow. We're going to release every single Tuesday. So next week, as I said before, John Smoltz joins us for a little bit of a, a fun mixture between the Masters and baseball. Thank you so much for listening. 